How's it going everyone? Welcome back to the Salamander Wilds. Welcome back to another video. So this time around, I want to really um, get a focus on aquatic larvae and talk a bit about them and their differences. And also, uh, really the differences between a certain larva, um, you know, Ambystoma, vernal pool dwelling larva, as opposed to a lungless salamander or stream dwelling larva. Because there are some key differences to note between the two types of larva and we could take a really good look at these differences so we can differentiate them out in the field. So with that, let's get into it. If you enjoyed the video, please remember to leave a like, share, comment down below, please subscribe, and here we go. So first things first, right here, this is a vernal pool. This is one of the key identifiers for finding certain aquatic larva, right? Not all salamanders utilize vernal pools, but certain ones do, and these are absolutely necessary for these larvae. And the type of larvae that live in these vernal pools cannot live in flowing streams. They have totally different oxygen levels and other properties, and even different levels of uh, food sources that make these different habitats completely uh, unique to those larval salamanders needs. So let's uh, actually take a peek underwater. I'm gonna grab my dip net here. Let's see what is in here. I actually already know what's in here. Um, there's marble salamander larva, there's spotted salamander larva, and uh, let's see what we could find. Let's see if we could find some marbled or spotted salamander larva. They both utilize this pool, but we're gonna see very quickly how different these species are in comparison to one another. So let's see if we can find anything. Oh, yep, I found something already. Very small, probably spotted salamander from what it looked like. There we go. See? That right there, that is a spotted salamander larva. When we look at this vernal pool Ambystoma larva, in particular of the spotted salamander, there's a few key details that we can see immediately that lets us know this is an Ambystoma salamander as opposed to a lungless stream-dwelling salamander. With these Ambystoma salamanders, you can see that the larvae are built for an aquatic environment where the water is slow moving, if moving at all. Their bodies overall have a more stocky build as opposed to the more streamlined build of a lungless salamander. And perhaps it's not as noticeable in this very tiny spotted salamander larva. However, as it grows and we take a look at larger vernal pool larva, this stocky build will become more noticeable, along with the broad head that these vernal pool Ambystoma salamanders have. After releasing the spotted salamander larva, I was able to find a marbled salamander larva, another vernal pool Ambystoma larva, sharing the same exact vernal pool actually with the spotted salamander larva. And here we could tell right away that this marbled salamander is bigger than the spotted salamander that we just saw, and yet it has the same Ambystoma characteristics as the spotted salamander that we just saw. And because this individual is much bigger and older than the spotted salamander larva, these characteristics are much more clear. Once we see uh, some stream-dwelling lungless salamanders, you're really gonna see how these differences stack up and uh, you know, once you really get to know these species and um, not just the species themselves, but overall, you know, these families of, you know, where these salamanders actually belong to, you're going to see, you know, how they're actually separated physically from each other too. So, uh, you know, it's a really good way to get to know these salamanders and tell the differences between them when you want to look for them yourself. And maybe you don't know what, you know, you found immediately, but you got some context clues to help you at least differentiate between one family or genus from another. So I actually just arrived at the stream that I want to poke around in 
And this is such a beautiful looking area. Let me flip the camera around here. It is absolutely gorgeous here. It is truly scenic. Um, I mean, just look at this flowing stream. It is such an incredible looking area. And <laughs> I might be exaggerating a bit here. It almost kind of feels so serene and looks like something out of a movie almost. It's so beautiful here. There are lungless salamanders in here, but they're a little difficult to find. So let's poke around. We're gonna go upstream and uh, we're gonna hopefully find some two-line salamander larva. Here we've got another lungless salamander habitat other than just the stream here. You see how the seepage just gently flows into the bigger stream there. And this is actually really, really good for duskies. So uh, this is really what I want to see for them. And I have found dusky salamander larvae in this stream. Could there be some in the more gentle areas? Yes, of course. But this is really what I want to see for duskies. Um, and we can really just start to see how habitats connect and overlap and uh, get a good idea of how different species can share, you know, the same habitat. Yeah, so uh, I was able to pull out a larval uh, two-line salamander. And that's exactly why I pulled out the dip net because, uh, you know, just trying to flip things in a seepage like this, you know, it would be very, very difficult, especially when they're just hiding under the leaves. And by the time I flip anything over, actually they would just get away. So this dip net comes in handy, obviously not just for vernal pool situations, but even a stream situations like this, right? Where some debris can pile up uh, where these animals hide. So let me pull out my underwater housing. Let's get a good look at this uh, salamander and talk about some lungless salamanders. When we see this larval two-line salamander from the top view, we can immediately notice a much more slender body build. And here, we actually get a really good look at that tail. And even then, this is much more slender in comparison to the much broader tail of an Ambystoma vernal pool dwelling salamander. The head and snout are also much more narrow, and even those gills have been shrunken down and aren't as long. This salamander is streamlined across the board and is built for the much more fast-paced habitat of the flowing stream in comparison to the stillness of a vernal pool. And here we can really get a good look at the difference between the two habitats. We can see the stillness of the vernal pool and get a clear idea of the low oxygen levels associated with it. And while dragonfly larvae lurk beneath these calm waters, small fish are present in the flowing streams where the lungless salamanders reside. Finally, here we can see both salamanders side by side, and the difference in head shape is immediately noticeable. The marbled salamander to the right has a much more broader head in comparison to the lungless salamander to the left with a much more narrow head. And the difference in gill shape is also immediately obvious. And from this angle with a different Ambystoma species, the differences in body shape are much more clear, along with the tail shape and tail fins. All right, so with that, I will wrap up the video here. Let me know what you think. Did you find this information useful? Um, you know, I really think it's important to highlight these differences between the different types of larvae that you could encounter while you're out and about. You know, if you see a stream, or in my case, this uh, vernal pool right behind me, you know, there's different types of salamanders and larvae especially are notoriously difficult to tell apart, um, even for people that are knowledgeable. 
and uh, myself included sometimes, right? Um, some of them look a little too similar to one another, but when you dig deep enough, you can sort out those differences with uh, some certain key indicators like I went over earlier in the video, right? Um, especially between Ambistema larva and, uh, you know, lungless salamander larva, um, habitat is a defining factor right there. So there's a lot of uh, key details that you can use to your advantage to tell some of these apart. These should help you differentiate between the species and the type of larva that you encounter. And also, I think it would be a missed opportunity if I didn't tie this back into the hobby. One thing that I really try to drive home when I do these sort of videos is not just identification out in the field, but tying it back to the hobby. As far as the hobby, salamanders are a pretty niche hobby, and as I've pointed out in past videos, um, there's a lack of information. There's definitely a lot more these days, of course, but it can still be difficult. And so I would definitely say, use these details to your advantage. It is always a great idea to translate how an animal behaves and lives in the wild into captivity. And so with that, I'll leave it there. If you enjoyed the video, please remember to leave a like, share, comment down below, please subscribe. Your support is very, very much appreciated. And until next time, everyone, stay curious and journey into the salamander wilds.